Welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Robert Earl Keen with Mr. Wolf and Mama Bear. And on this week's show, I'm going to continue the theme of kind of chemistry and, and physics that I've had for the last three shows. And if you've been listening, you know that all of this was prompted by a book that I read about the history of the periodic table. And then I kind of went into some biographies of some really interesting uh, chemists and physicists. And then I talked a little bit uh, also about tin and about the atom. And now I'm going to get a little bit more biological and talk about how some of that information can actually be applied in uh, biological studies. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on isotopic analyses. And I've mentioned these a couple times throughout all of these kind of chemistry and, and physics shows that I've done. And I've also mentioned them in the past with reference to some other um, biological studies that I've done because isotope analyses are really useful for looking at where organisms have been and what sorts of foods they're eating and kind of uh, both of those things simultaneously. So what are they eating when they're in certain places? So today I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that have been done very recently. So these have both been published within the last few weeks in the academic, the, the scientific literature. And one of them uh, focuses mostly on bears living in the U.S., and the other focuses mostly on humans and also their uh, kind of prey species, if you like, that lived here in Europe thousands of years ago. So I'm going to talk about each of these papers in uh, pretty much in the amount of depth that you would go into if you were in a scientific classroom, for example, or a seminar series or a discussion group, and you wanted to go through the paper and kind of pick it apart and think about what it means and what was done, whether that was appropriate. So I'm going to give you kind of that scientific level of discussion, but hopefully in terms that make a lot more sense. And you can kind of see how these sorts of studies would be put together and how these sorts of techniques can be used in an applied way. So the first study that I want to talk about uh, is by a group of international researchers, predominantly based in North America, but also from even further abroad, who were interested in looking at black bears living in Yosemite National Park, which is in California. And they were interested in looking not just at contemporary black bears, but also black bears that have lived there over the past several decades, in fact, for over a century, because they, want, they wanted to get an idea of how these animals are impacted by the presence of people and the presence of human-supplied foods. And they wanted to get an idea of what sort of impact this uh, the availability of these sorts of things could have on the bears themselves in terms of their eating habits, but then also potentially on the ecosystem at large. So what they're really focusing on here is something that they termed synanthropization, and this is the adaptation of wildlife populations to both humans and human-impacted environments. So the bears in this example are synanthropic species because they exhibit this kind of behavioral plasticity where normally they wouldn't eat certain types of food because, uh, well, they wouldn't be available, so humans wouldn't be providing human food or certain introduced species. But once those things were brought into the habitat, the bears were plastic enough to adapt their behavior and start eating these things when they were available. And in fact, we sometimes see not just behavioral changes over the short term, but also even evolutionary changes, so things that become kind of permanent because it can impact breeding and it can impact genes and it can change these things that are passed on from one generation to the next. And sometimes we also see expanded ranges, increased populations, all sorts of things in response to this kind of uh, disturbance. And sometimes, Whenever species exhibit these sorts of changes, it can put them in greater conflict with humans. And of course, human-wildlife conflict is something I've talked a lot about on the show in the past. And it doesn't just happen when you've got animals that attack people or that are quite dangerous. You know, I've talked about tigers and elephants, for example. But it can also happen with animals that are uh, actually quite pleasant and they just kind of want to meander through your backyard and rifle through your trash. Because this can also be a real problem. And with bears, you've kind of got something in between the two. So normally bears aren't aggressive, but they can become problematic if you encounter them in the right situation. So for example, if you find a mother bear with her offspring, that's no good. Um, and they also can be quite peaceful. Uh, I lived for a while actually in Shenandoah National Park and had bears in my yard all of the time and they never caused any problem. So you never really know what you're going to get when it comes to black bears and I think that's probably part of the problem and why they're interested in tackling this in Yosemite. So 
one of the things that they were particularly focused on was the fact that whenever these animals, uh, bears are only one example, we might think of foxes because we have a lot of foxes in urban areas, uh, coyotes are another example from the U.S. Whenever you've got these sorts of things coming into the human areas and taking advantage of human foods, it can alter their foraging patterns, it can alter the way that they then, they then disperse from their feeding sites, it can then change uh, the sorts of distribution of things, so maybe they would have normally eaten berries, for example, and then distributed the berries as they kind of pooed along the way as they left, and now they're no longer doing that. So this can have uh, much larger ecological impacts on the ecosystem, on the landscape, and this could be a potentially problematic thing if some of these things are very important for keeping the ecosystem afloat, if they're important for uh, forging bonds in the food web, if they also are related to any kind of ecosystem services that humans are interested in. This could have serious implications for people and even economic implications. And this is all why they wanted to use Yosemite as kind of a microcosm to study these sorts of effects and think about how this one system might reflect potentially some other things that are going on elsewhere. And Yosemite is a, an, another good place uh, to look at this because there is a lot of conflict or there has been some conflict in the past. So over the last 20 years, there have been 12,000 reported incidents of human-bear conflict. There have been over 50 injuries and some uh, almost $4 million in damage because the bears will come and kind of raid tents and raid food areas. They'll even climb into cars if the windows are left down. And of course, this doesn't always work out so well for the bears because uh, rangers might end up killing them or relocating them. And the public doesn't always like that either, so the public doesn't like this direct uh, contact between them and, and problem bears, but they also usually don't like it when they find out that bears have been killed because they feel that you know wild animals should be protected in these kind of uh, national park type areas. So all of this is obviously something that is in need of review so that you can kind of see how all of this is working and how best to address it. And the current study was interested in looking at how the foraging ecology of these black bears has responded to changes in the various human management strategies that have happened over time uh, in Yosemite. So, as I said, there have been a number of things that they've done. Relocating is one of them, killing is another, but there are also some other things. For example, in the past there used to be platforms where they would actually try to draw bears in, so they would leave out food for them, but those were eventually eliminated. They have put a lot of money in, into animal proofing the waste receptacles and to providing places where campers can store their food safely. They've hazed animals that have shown a lot of interest in people and people areas in order to get them to go to those places less. And they've kind of done all of these in shifts, some of them together, some of them separately over time. And they've had, you know, more or less, they've had varying degrees of success, shall we say. And so what they wanted to see was how did the actual diet of the bears reflect the kind of successes that they noted anecdotally in response to these sorts of regimes? And how are the bears doing now after thousands and thousands of dollars have been put into these efforts? Have we now kind of reached a stage where all those things have worked cumulatively over the years and put the bears back kind of to where they were before humans went in and started making a lot of changes to the ecosystem? And in order to look at this, they used stable isotope analysis. So that's where all of this chemistry finally comes into play. So they used this analysis to estimate the proportion of anthropogenic foods, uh, both human foods directly, so things uh, that people were eating and then maybe tossing away or maybe throwing out on purpose to the animals, but also human-related foods, so introduced animals, specifically fish that had been introduced in hatcheries in the area. So they wanted to see how much of these things the black bears were eating in four different historical periods that I'll go to, into here in a minute in more detail. So they wanted to esti estimate the proportional contributions of each of these types of food sources from bone and hair samples collected from the bears. And not only were they able to put out some traps and collect hair samples now, reflecting contemporary bears, but they were also able to go into museums and collect skeleton, uh, specifically skull samples of bone and also teeth, and also take some pelt samples from these um, things that were in museums that had been previously collected from Yosemite National Park. So they have this really nice historical sample that reflects all these bears in the region. This allows them to then kind of get an idea of what changes were happening, if any, 
over time. So what they were specifically looking at when they were analyzing these samples were isotopes of both carbon and nitrogen. And normally carbon comes in uh, the, the 12 neutron variation, but also in a 13 neutron variation. So 13 is the isotope of interest here because you're, you're interested in seeing what is the proportion of 13 to 12. And for nitrogen, you've got the same thing with 14 being kind of the normal one that we tend to see most of. 15 being the one that's a bit more unusual, so you look at the ratio of 15 to 14. And they were able to collect samples um, kind of representing a period from 1915 to about uh, 1985 out of the museums, and then they were able to collect the ones that were more contemporary between 2001 and 2007. Now what's interesting about this is that even though these samples were taken in those time periods, actually they reflect different time periods of diet because sometimes it takes longer for the isotopes to actually be laid down in these different parts of the body. So hair tends to be created all along, whereas bone might happen uh, at only a given time. And this is actually true, there's a lot of variation for fecal samples and blood plasma. So there's a lot of variation in how long it takes for the components of a diet to then make their way into the various physiological systems of the bears. And so um, they've had to then kind of do this, uh, what, they're kind of adjusting all of their values to represent the fact that even though they're looking at something that was collected at a certain time, it actually might reflect diet that was a bit earlier, or, uh, well, yeah, of varying degrees of earliness prior to when those samples were actually collected. So they've done all of that in order to make sure that they're actually focusing on this period that basically ranges from just before the turn of the 20th century to just around the turn of the 21st century. And they were then able to use this information to create what they call an isotopic mixing space. And basically what this means is that they have uh, a graph where they indicate all of the different uh, potential proportions of diet that are made up of these different types of food. So if you've got uh, kind of a range of values that you would expect if an animal were only eating the natural food versus the human food versus the introduced non-native species from people, you kind of have a range there where you know um, from, from the lowest amount to the highest amount what would you expect in terms of an isotopic range within that type of food. But then you would never really expect an animal to have only that one type of food. These bears tend to be quite omnivorous and to be opportunistic, and so they kind of go around and eat whatever they can find. So in reality, what you find is it's going, the diet's going to reflect a mixture of all of these things. And that's what the isotopic mixing space shows. It allows you to kind of have this almost 3D sort of visualization that combines information from all three of these things. So you can then plot the values for each bear and see kind of to what extent it's uh, pulling each of these different components into its diet and how important each of these things was to a particular bear's diet. And then you can average across bears to see, you know, across your whole population, how common is this sort of behavior, how important is this type of food. So thinking about each of these foods in a little bit more detail, the natural foods what they tend to show is that they have lower nitrogen and carbon isotope levels. And so you would expect to find uh, fairly distinct values for the bears that are eating more natural stuff than for the bears that have the high nitrogen and car carbon isotope values from the more human-affected uh, foods. And the endpoint for, for these values are the endpoints were calculated taking samples from bears that lived in the area prior to the introduction of anthropogenic food items. So they were able to find kind of the lowest range of expected values from those bears that were the earliest samples taken from museums. And these bears, of course, they lived there before there were really any human influences. And so that is what you would expect for a diet to look like if there is no contribution of anthropogenic foods to that bear's diet. So that's how they create kind of the low range, what they call the end point, for that type of, of food. For the trout, so they specifically I said they were looking at these introduced fish and hatcheries. Most important were the trout that were raised in these hatcheries, and they were able to create this kind of uh, dietary uh, 
um, regime picture, basically, by taking specimens of the trout themselves that were grown in that area. And again, these were found in museums. And they were able to look at the trout samples and see, okay, if, the, if these contain a certain amount of isotope, then how much of that would be converted into the bears, and then how much would you expect to pick up in the bear samples themselves. So they use this kind of characterization to get an idea of the end point for bears that would only eat trout. And for human foods, they performed analyses of people themselves. So of course you would expect humans to have uh, a very distinct kind of characterization of their diets because that is what we eat. And so you would expect that a bear that's eating the same thing as human would look very similar to the humans. And so they took human hairs that were collected in the 40s and also in the early 80s and also in 2004 and 2009. So they have this nice range of different human values over the years. So they, they wouldn't just take contemporary values and look at those in comparison to the past, but they could actually have this whole range throughout the study period that they were focusing on. And this again allowed them to kind of figure out if you have a bear at one end of the spectrum or another for each of these values, what does that mean in terms of what it's actually eating? And all of the isotopic data also take into account the fact that over time we've changed our use of carbon, and so we've burnt through a lot of carbon, we've changed the ratios in the atmosphere automatically, and so actually it accounts for this and takes uh, into account the fossil fuel combustion that we've done over the past 150 years, which I thought was really interesting. They are able to actually, uh, you know, pay attention to the fact that we are altering these things and then adjust their values accordingly so that they do still make sense relative to the actual environmental conditions. Now, I said earlier that everything was developed uh, to look at things in four distinct time periods. Now the first one of these was 1890 to 1922, and this is when, uh, this is very early on in the life of Yosemite National Park. Early on there was quite low bear abundance. Bears might sometimes access some human foods at garbage dump, but you know there weren't a lot of these things happening because the bears weren't really used to it yet. They hadn't become um, synanthromorphic yet. Then the next period was, well also during that period there was a fish hatchery that was opened at this time, so it was raising these non-native fish that I mentioned. And the next period was 1923 to 1971, which is actually quite a long period, but this is a time that has another hatchery that was raising trout. It also had these artificial feeding areas that I mentioned, and so of course you can imagine that these were quite popular early on in the in the century when people weren't really thinking about how destructive it was actually to create these behaviors in the bears. And then much later, you know, people were beginning to realize that humans should have maybe a lighter impact on the environment. So little by little, these platforms closed. But the last one didn't actually shut until the early 70s. And so that's when you have the ending of this particular period. In period three, that's 1972 to 1998, and this is when you've got all these bears that suddenly have you know, they've developed this taste for human foods, they've been eating at those platforms, but now the platforms are gone. And so they've gone out in search of foods elsewhere. They've gone into concession areas and campgrounds. And this is when you begin to have all these incidents that are becoming much and much more common, where you've got kind of the human-bear conflict arising, and lots of property damage, and even some attacks. And that prompted a management plan that was initiated in 1975. And Basically, this is when all of these techniques that I mentioned earlier began, uh, began to be used. So things like relocating the bears, killing the bears, putting out all the bear-proof things. And that was still kind of in its early days and wasn't really done as well as it was from 1999 to 2007, which is the final period, because this is when the government actually gave Yosemite a big chunk of money to really do these things right and put them in in full effect. So from this period onward, that's when they really expected to find that there would be a significant change in the diets, in the isotopes of the bears, because that's when the government really was putting that push forward to try to keep the bears away from the human food. So what they found when they looked at all of these tissue samples was that the isotopic composition did indeed change over time, as you would expect if the bears were changing their diets. And in, in particular, the changes were associated with alterations to feeding patterns that were associated specifically with those anthropogenic foods. So between 1915 and 1939 they found an increase in nitrogen and this is associated with the installation of those feeding platforms where the bears are getting all of those human foods 
And then afterwards it decreased again, which shows that once you take the platforms away and the bears don't have as much human food, they're resorting to the more natural stuff that has the no lower nitrogen levels. They also observed pretty stable carbon in the first two periods, but then a big increase after the closure of the feeding areas and also the hatcheries. And this is associated with the fact that um, you've got these bears that are kind of going into the, the kind of concession areas and campgrounds that I mentioned, and they're doing a lot more foraging and picking up the carbon there. But in more recent years, that's gone down again after all these measures have been put in place. The proportion of human foods in the bear diets has changed quite a lot over time as well. So it increased when people fed bears intentionally. It remained quite high and constant after the closure of the feeding areas because, again, the bears were still getting those human foods by going out elsewhere. But then it declined again after government intervention. And in fact, it declined so substantially that it now looks actually quite similar to the way it looked before people were in Yosemite at all. And over the past hundred years, they've calculated kind of the, the percentages, the, the variation that you find within individual bears. So over that time period, you find that bears would eat anywhere from 31 to 92 percent from natural sources, plants and animals. So you've got some individuals that are almost exclusively eating natural foods, but then you've also got other individuals that only eat that stuff for about a third of their diet. During that early period, those early two periods when you've got the fisheries, they found anywhere from, 12, uh, from 2 to 11 percent of trout making up the diet, and that was actually fairly constant throughout those two periods. So the bears liked that stuff, but they weren't really indulging in it too much. But what you really see the variation in is human foods, and that's anywhere from 7 to 69 percent. And what's quite interesting is that even though you generally do see this decrease, um, kind of from, from period three, which was the peak, down to period four, there are still some bears that show really high levels. So despite the fact that overall the, uh, the measures that the government have put in place do seem to be working, the isotope results suggest that some individuals still have a real taste for human foods and are finding ways to get at it, despite all of the foolproof mechanisms, supposedly foolproof, that uh, the rangers have put in place. So what's interesting about all of this is that when you put it into context, it shows that black bears that consume these human foods do tend to have highly flexible diets. So they aren't necessarily wedded to only having one time, but they do quite like to have that food when they can get it. And they're able to get lots of protein and lots of calories out of this, and this is probably one of the reasons why it's such an attractive uh, source of, of um, satisfaction for them, dietarily speaking, because it is something that kind of packs a big punch. And, you know, these are animals that like to hibernate, and this food is perfect for hibernating because it's got all of that energy. There are clear signs that changes in management strategies have led to changes in anthropogenic food consumption in the direction that uh, the authorities have wanted, and that's really good to see because there are some bears, of course, that are now weaning themselves off of this and going back to their average diet. But like I mentioned earlier, there are also some that still seem to have a taste for this food, and obviously something needs to be done about these if we want to try to minimize conflict and if we want to try to get bears back into eating their, their normal stuff. The authors did find that there is a pretty high probability that modern bears have diets that are quite similar to those of bears from the early 1900s. Now they can't say this for 100% certainty because you know they're just using isotopes here. They don't actually have samples of the food itself. So you can only be so specific when you're just looking uh, at these different atoms. But it is quite good evidence that more or less they have kind of the same balance of foods, which is a really good sign. And one of the reasons that that is such a good sign is that bears are what the authors refer to as a conduit for nutrients into and, and around the Yosemite ecosystem. And normally, as I mentioned at the very beginning, they would do things like maybe eat berries and then distribute the seeds as they move. Or they would eat something in one location and go to another and deposit uh, all the, the results of that elsewhere. Uh, you know, all the undigested stuff, they might leave it behind. And so that is making a difference in the ecosystem by moving nutrients around, by spreading plants, and, um, and kind of helping the ecosystem to keep, to keep functioning and to keep going. And suddenly when you've got bears not doing that as much, or when you've got them bringing in nutrients from the anthropogenic habitat, that can really shift things around. If you do have quite high 
um, levels of certain nutrients within people food, which we know that there are, and you suddenly inject these into an ecosystem, well that can cause a big flux because suddenly you've got an imbalance, you've maybe got more of something that you didn't have in the past and now that enables something else to grow that maybe was kind of held in check, or maybe you suddenly have much less of something that was quite needed and so now you've got a plant, for example, or a fungus that isn't able to grow. There are all sorts of scenarios that would allow this to disrupt the ecosystem in general. Now they do also know that this could have effects not just on the ecosystem at large, but also on the bear populations, which would also go on to have an effect on the ecosystem. So it can be both direct and indirect, these impacts. So for example, we know that the bears that tend to eat more human foods can be larger and have higher reproductive rates and also bigger litter sizes, also have a lower breeding age, and tend to be killed more by management staff because they become problem bears. So all of this is changing two basic things that are really important, and one is fitness and one is survival. And by fitness, of course, I mean the scientific uh, value of that, which means reproductive success, basically. And when you're changing the amount of offspring and the health of offspring and also the length of lifespan of an organism, then that really can go on to have significant impacts and promote um, you know, natural selection on these organisms and that can really change the whole population which can then go on to change the ecosystem because suddenly you might have more or fewer animals doing different things and that can have cascading impacts. And so this is one of the things that the authors really want to look at in more detail. So they've got all of the groundwork here that suggests that everything is just right for this kind of anthropogenic food um, flux to have an impact on the ecosystem, but we don't really know if it has in the past and if it has in what way. And maybe we can go back and do more analyses with other isotopes, um, with other types of organisms, Maybe we can find some other sorts of data, not just isotopes, but looking at you know, soil samples, looking at uh, distributions of organisms, all sorts of things where you could really see if these human nutrients have had an impact on the ecosystem. And one of the things they're really interested in looking at is the stuff that can be classified as an ecosystem process. So things like seed dispersal, which I've already mentioned a few times, primary production, um, you know, so the growth of plants and the growth of other things that are taking the sun's energy and turning that into biomass of some sort, and also nutrient cycling. So could this have had an impact on the ecological functioning of all the systems, and is it going to continue in the future? To what level do we need to minimize anthrop anthropogenic food eating in bears to really make sure that this is not having too big of an impact on the system, or is any level of it going to have a measurable impact? So these are all the sorts of questions that you can begin to explore using something as simple as uh, an atom that has just an extra neutron in the nucleus. So that is that study, and I'm going to break and give you a couple of songs so you can kind of reset, and then we'll come back and think a little bit more about how isotope analysis can be used to look at ancient history and um, the development of kind of eating and, and feeding preferences in humans. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Radiohead with Hunting Bears, followed by Dolly Parton with These Old Bones. And today I am talking about a couple of recent academic papers that have utilized stable isotope analysis. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how this particular technique can be used to uh, understand a lot of information about things that are kind of invisible otherwise. So it allows us to infer a lot of stuff that we might otherwise never have been able to get information about. So just before the break I was talking about how some researchers in the North, uh, Western North America were able to take samples of bears from museums and also from the field and look at the stable isotopes in these tissues and figure out what the bears had been eating over the different time scales uh, from which those, those samples were collected. And that's really important information because it allows them to draw some conclusions about management patterns within Yosemite National Park where the bears were living. So that's quite a good example of how this analysis can be used in kind of a conservation and management setting, but also it's something that can tell us a little bit about history. So obviously the bears are history as well, but I'm talking about 
you know, serious history in terms of what were these things doing at different points in the past and what does this mean for us today, which is a slightly different question from what they were looking at uh, in the black bears, because in this case it's looking at human history and trying to figure out how it is that humans came into Europe and dominated Neanderthals and replaced Neanderthals eventually. And you wouldn't think that this is necessarily something that you could find out much about by looking at stable isotopes, but in fact there is a team of researchers that has looked at some evidence in order to figure out if some of the previous analyses that have been done are accurate or if maybe they're kind of missing out on certain patterns. And the reason that they've done this is that there it has been a, a period of time that's been the focus of, of these researchers who are looking at kind of the shift between Neanderthal domination of Europe and what they refer to as anatomically modern humans. And I'll just refer to them as early humans from now on. So this, this shift happened during the middle to upper Paleolithic period, which is about 35,000 years ago. And the reasons for this shift have been debated. Some people suggest that there was climatic instability, so the environment was in flux, conditions were quite uncomfortable, and maybe these just happened to favor early humans rather than Neanderthals. However, other people have pointed out that actually the variation that you find in this period isn't any greater or any less than variation that we've seen elsewhere, so it's kind of strange to say that only at this one time would it be significant enough to affect uh, the, these hominid species that were living in the area. So another suggestion that's come up is that there has been competition between the Neanderthals and the early humans, and that the latter won out because they had different behavior and different diets. So, for instance, more efficient hunting behaviors, more dietary diversity, and so we're better able to use a bunch of different resources that maybe the Neanderthals weren't taking advantage of. So let's think about that in a little bit more detail. If the dietary preferences were different, this might re uh, reflect the fact that Neanderthals tended to focus mainly on large ungulates, and we know this from a lot of archaeological digs. Now, hu early humans also did this, but there is greater evidence suggesting that they focus on a wider variety of resources, so things like fish and fowl and small mammals. And one of the most interesting of these is fish, because fish are, of course, um, coming from the water, so whether that's uh, the sea or from fresh water, they're still coming from a different ecosystem part. Uh, and so one of the things you can look at with your stable isotopes is, you know, what are the isotopes like in aquatic environments? What are they like in terrestrial environments? And is this kind of shift reflected in what we're seeing of the remains of the foods of these different types of people, and then the, the human and Neanderthal remains as well. So you can kind of try to uh, tie those different habitats, and therefore the different food items, in with the bones of these ancient hominids. Now the other theory is that their subsistence strategies were different. So this is a bit harder to look at because this is kind of a, a thing that you don't really see a lot of evidence of physically. but you can find things like tools and maybe some paintings and caves and other sorts of archaeological finds. And in fact, there is some evidence that Neanderthals were more complex than we have typically given them credit for being. And I've talked about this a little bit on the past, uh, on the show in the past, actually, how there is some evidence that Neanderthals had more complex hunting strategies, they had more complex interactions with each other, and so actually they would have been maybe not that different from humans, and capable of getting the same sorts of things and having the same sort of diversity. And in fact, there have been previous stable isotope analyses of paleo diets, and some of these have suggested that humans did have a broader dietary spectrum than the Neanderthals. And the reason that people have postulated this is that there are higher uh, nitrogen, so we're talking again about 15 nitrogen instead of 14 nitrogen. Um, there's been a higher ratio of that in humans than in Neand Neanderthals, which potentially reflects these differences between fresh water and terrestrial resources, so this utilization of fish. However, this assumes a lot of things, and one of these is that the values in terrestrial food webs were consistent across all of this time period, this uh, really long period during which you see the turnover between Neanderthals and modern humans. Also, it suggests that um, there was no change in the abundance of this particular isotope in the terrestrial ecosystems 
uh, or between the two different types of ecosystems, terrestrial and aquatic. And these are all some explanations for actually why you might see differences. So it might not be differences in actual diets that are driving these variations between Neanderthals and humans, but in fact environmental variations, so that you just happen to see shifts of isotopes in these two habitats or between these two habitats, and so that is what's reflected here. Maybe people are eating the same thing all along, and it's just that the isotopes themselves are changing and not uh, the diets of these two different types of hominids. So that is what these guys were interested in looking at in this new study. Now it's been quite difficult to explore these potential possibilities in the past because there haven't been sites that have lots of specimens. So what they did was they found a particular area in southwest France that has lots and lots of samples in kind of a, um, a, a pretty close region. So there are lots of different sites within this one little region where you've got kind of similar environmental conditions, lots of different samples to choose from. So they could do um, this analysis that spanned quite a long time, thousands of years, between the Neanderthals and the early humans to try to get an idea of what are the nitrogen levels like over this big period of time. Are they changing? Are there differences between um, areas in which you see mostly humans and mostly Neanderthals and a little bit of each? Because if you go to a Neanderthal encampment and find something quite different from the humans and can definitively say that that's because of actual changes in diet, then that would really allow you to say something about the differences between these two groups and whether that difference might have driven uh, the eventual domination of people. So what they did was they found these eight different sites that have quite similar ecological conditions, like I said, but were occupied at different times and so reflect the diets of different um, humans or Neanderthals. And they found across these sites four different phases so one of them was from 22,000 to 28,000 years before now, and that probably represents occupation during quite a cold climate. You've got the second phase, which was 28,000 to about 35,000 years before now, and that's when you kind of had a colder climate giving way into a milder climate. Phase three, 42,000 to 46,000 years before now. This is some of the last Neanderthals living in southwestern Europe. And then phase four, 41,000 to 60,000 years before now, definitely inhabited by Neanderthals, which actually were doing quite well at this time. This was long before they died out. And this particular um, phase represented in these sites actually encompassed several different climatic and vegetation fluctuations. Um, so those things I was talking about at the very beginning that some people had suggested, suggested might be one of the things that drove Neanderthals. Um, to give way to humans. So basically what you've got here is four different layers where you've got the, the layers closest to the top being the youngest and the most human representative and the further back you go, the further down you go, the more you're moving towards the Neanderthals. And from these they were able to get a large selection of mammal bones, so both herbivorous and carnivorous species. The herbivores were reindeer and red deer and auric and bison and also horse. And these were the main prey that were hunted by both Neanderthals and modern humans, in particular the auric and the bison. They also sampled from wolves because wolves would be kind of the, a, a proxy for the carnivorous portion of the diets of humans living at that time. And so you can kind of get an idea of um, if, if humans were eating all you know, all meat and not other stuff, then you can kind of get an, an idea of the extreme, the isotopic extreme of what their diet might look like. And for all of these species, they were taking small pieces of bone or dentine from the skeletal remains in order to perform the isotopic analysis. And what they found is that, as you might expect, there are differences among the different species that they were looking at. So reindeer were at one end of the isotope spectrum, followed by red deer, and then the large bovines, and then the horse at the other end of the spectrum. And this reflects the differences in the diets of these organisms. And so each one of them has its own isotopic signature, and then the people, uh, the hominids that were eating those things, would then reflect the isotopic signature in their own tissues because, of course, uh, they're going to incorporate what it is that they eat. Now the researchers also found differences through time, and they looked not only at nitrogen, but also carbon. And they, they did carbon just kind of as something that they could compare to the nitrogen. And what they found was that carbon didn't change at all 
over time. It basically was more or less the same regardless of era. However, this is not what they saw for the nitrogen isotopes. And what they found in particular was that phase two, which was the one that was 28,000 to 36,000 years ago, was quite different from all the other phases. And in particular, they kind of had identified two subphases. And one of them, subphase uh, 2b, which spanned 31,000 to 36,000 years ago. This was the phase where everything was particularly different, and this was the one that was really driving this variation between phase two and everything else. And in this time, they saw much higher nitrogen levels than in any other time. And this reflects the fact that the, the organisms, the hominids that were eating in this time, had a much greater reliance on the reindeer and the deer end of the spectrum rather than on the bovine and the horse end. And that's because, again, the, the bovine and the horse end have lower nitrogen. The other, the kind of the red deer end of the spectrum, they have much higher. And so this is how you can get an idea of which of the organisms these hominids are eating at that time. So clearly they've shifted their food preference, or something has happened so that the um, that shift was kind of decided for them, so maybe those were the only organisms that were available at the time. But whatever exactly the case was, there was a clear difference in the diet in this particular period. Uh, period. And what's interesting is that when they compared wolves to the ungulates, they found that wolves also had this similar kind of pattern. And so this suggests that there is something going on out there in the environment, in the habitat, and it's being reflected not just in the ungulates that are eating um, the grasses and the other sorts of vegetation, but also in the wolves and probably, again, also the humans that are eating those, um, those herbivores. So this suggests that there's actually a widespread change going on, and it's not just something that is very specific to the ungulates or very specific to either the Neanderthals or the humans, but in fact, everything in the region is showing this, uh, this similar change. And of course, it's hard to say exactly what's happening here, but this does suggest that uh, there's something happening in the environment that is related maybe to temperature and maybe to uh, the moisture content so that some plants are doing better than others and then the animals that eat those plants are surviving a bit better, eating lots of them, and all of this is cascading up the food chain so that you see it reflected in the tissues of the humans. Uh, and I keep saying humans, but what I really mean is all the hominids, the Neanderthals and the people both. And some of this may be mediated by the fact that plants, uh, as they draw up nutrients from the soil, this is being helped by mycorrhizae and other symbionts that are living in the soil. So these environmental differences may be impacting those guys and making it more or less difficult for the plants to get these things, the nitrogen in particular, out of the soil. And you also could have something where you've got herbivores that are shifting from a browsing diet to a grazing diet, so this would reflect the shift from leaves with low nitrogen to uh, leaves with high nitrogen, because again this would impact their tissues. Although you'd expect that to be accompanied by a change in carbon, which we don't see, and that's why it suggests that it's not so much a behavioral thing with the animals, uh, you know, something like they're migrating, they're shifting foods, they suddenly prefer something different, but it's probably more uh, on a, a larger level, on a broader level. And in particular, they think that maybe there is a change in uh, the temperature so that it's kind of cool, but at the same time it's kind of arid, because those are the two conditions that simultaneously might help drive these changes in plants. It's not quite a perfect match, but that is kind of the best thing that explains this. But even though there is some uncertainty about what exactly would have driven this pattern, because there are lots of abiotic and biotic things. There could have been fires, there could have been differences in grazing intensity. So some of the other organisms that they didn't measure here, things like mammoths, um, you know, all these can have a role as well in, in shifting what is available and what's being eaten by the herbivores and therefore um, the things that are eating those herbivores. But what really matters is that there are these broad variations. And this means that it's quite hard for you to say that the differences between uh, early humans and Neanderthals that came before them are associated only with differences in how they're hunting and what they're hunting. Because actually, what seems to be the case is that everything shifted in the whole environment. And so earlier people were going to be forced into having a diet different than later people, or actually vice versa, I guess. 
simply because of this shift throughout the whole habitat. So the nitrogen levels are always going to look different from the Neanderthals to the early humans because that is the, the way it was growing. That was the, the way the, the plants were growing, that's the way the herbivores were eating, that's the way the carnivores are going to eat the herbivores and reflect it in their own tissue. So it's not necessarily something that's behavioral on the part of the hominids, but in fact it's just uh, a, a pattern that you see throughout the environment. And this isotope analysis suggests that you really have to stop and kind of look more closely than we had realized in the past, and that uh, you have to maybe come up with another explanation for how it is that we had a shift from Neanderthals to humans. And this is kind of a nice example of how science can answer some questions or kind of give you a better picture in one way, but then also raise lots of questions at the same time and, and force you to come up with a whole new study in order to follow up on what you've just done. So both of these have been examples of very different ways in which isotope analysis has been used to look a bit, a bit further into kind of biology and history, anthropology even. So this kind of chemical and, and physical evidence can be used in lots of different ways, which I think uh, is one of the reasons why it's so fascinating to learn about these techniques and to learn about science because it really does kind of pervade lots of other fields as well. And with that, I think I will wrap up for the day, and maybe next week I will move away finally from the chemistry and the physics and give you guys a bit of a break and tell you about some other stuff. But for now, I will leave you with Michael Kiwanuka singing Bones. <laughs>